Hi there, my name is Michael Zilmer and I'm a composer. I work primarily in film and video games. In this video we'll do a quick walkthrough of one of my recent pieces called Mountain Giants. Also, I'll talk a little bit about my general workflow and we'll go over what kind of virtual instruments and effects plugins I've used in this piece. I do tend to ramble on a little bit too much when talking about some of these topics, but for the purposes of this current video, I'll try to keep everything as brief as possible and go into more depth on some of these topics in future videos. For example, I'm planning to do a video in which I explain how I've set up a tablet with a piece of software called Lima to display and control all of the various articulations of all the orchestral instruments. But now let me tell you a little bit more about the album that this track is from. Myths is a collection of musical narratives woven into a story. It's orchestral fantasy music inspired by video games. The track Mountain Giants, as the name would suggest, is about encountering huge, lumbering, dangerous creatures and about the conflict that ensues. Now, while the track is playing, I'll try to zoom into the individual instrumental parts to show you a little bit of the MIDI data that's behind these performances. I'll do my best to try and keep up with the playhead. All right, here we go. So how do I approach a piece like this? Well, usually I start with a simple piano sketch in which I try to outline all of the main melodic and harmonic ideas behind the piece. 
Now unfortunately here I've already deleted that sketch so I can't play you what it was. But anyway, so once I have that sketch I start orchestrating the piece and that means performing each one of these instruments individually on a MIDI keyboard except for these tracks down here which are my live instruments. Playing each one of these lines in on a MIDI keyboard ensures that uh, there's a certain degree of humanity to the performance. Now there might be some people watching this video who are right now going, hang on, I'm absolutely positive you've copied some of these MIDI regions like for instance these ones here. And that's true to an extent. As a time-saving trick, sometimes when I'm working with multiple instruments from one library, I'll copy over the MIDI CC data, but delete the note data and perform that again. So that way I already have a basic dynamic shape that will probably only require a little bit of tweaking. So next, let's look at my full template. The tracks you see in front of you right now are just the instruments that I needed for this current piece. However, there are many more tracks in my full template. and The rest of them are at the moment hidden. Let's show them. Now that's quite a few more tracks. Here we've got high woodwinds, low woodwinds, woodwind ensembles, high brass, low brass, brass ensembles, including effects, percussion uh, split into high skins, low skins, uh, metals, woods and toys, mallets, and timpani and kits, etc. And then we've got miscellaneous instruments and a whole bunch of ethnic instruments. Uh, also split into various categories. And finally, we've got strings, high and low, string ensembles, and then at the very bottom, we've got extra, so live instruments and whatever synths I might be using. Now, the biggest problem with a large template like this is that simply because of the huge number of tracks in here, and navigating around and finding the right things that you need gets a little bit difficult. This is another place where I use an iPad with lemur on it to control visibility. With a press of a button, I can do this. But we'll go into how one can use various visibility options to speed up the workflow in a future video. Now, let's look at some of the libraries that I've used on this track. Woodwinds. SSWW and SF both stand for one thing, which is the Spitfire Symphonic Woodwinds library. I think the inconsistency in naming is just a leftover from a previous version of my orchestral template. Moving on to brass. Here I've used mostly Berlin brass with uh, just a few tracks of Metropolis Arc 1, both from orchestral tools. Then percussion. This is Darwin percussion from Spitfire Albion 3. There's a couple of tracks of Hans Zimmer percussion by Spitfire in there. A few things from Berlin percussion and a few other bits and pieces from Spitfire Albion 1 and 2. And then next we've got strings. In this piece I've only used the Cinematic Studio strings. And then below that we've got a few extra tracks and those are my live instruments that I've recorded myself. Plus there is a few bars of a synth bass down there as well. So let's listen to some of these instruments in isolation now. First let's check out strings. Cinematic Studio Strings is a fantastic string library, probably my favorite at the moment, and especially for its melodic capabilities. Listen. While there are several truly excellent sounding string libraries out there, I don't think many of them can claim that they're able to produce a musical line with as much expression and intention as this library. Why don't we move right on and next let's look at woodwinds. I'm a huge fan of the colors that woodwinds add to the orchestral palette and as a result I'm always looking for places where they fit. So here in Mountain Giants, I'm using a whole bunch of low woodwind instruments. I've got a bass clarinet, a contrabass clarinet, three bassoons, and a total of five contrabassoons. That's a formidable army of low woodwind instruments, and it's exactly what I thought this track needed. Let's have a listen to what they sound like without the rest of the orchestra. That sounds great, but I needed it to be a little nastier, so I put in some low brass. I think the result is a very interesting color where you combine the 
sharp uh, raspier attack of the low brass instruments with the low dark sustained round sound that the low woodwinds have to offer. So let's maybe move on now and let's listen to the brass instruments in isolation and we'll do that in the latter section of the piece. Here. <laughs> As you've probably noticed, there's quite a few small problems with this performance. When you listen to it in isolation, there's a few notes that don't quite gel with the rest, a few that stick out, but none of this is really a big problem when you listen to the entire orchestra all at once. See what it sounds like. That's kind of a general rule when working with virtual instruments. As your arrangement gets busier, you can just sort of get away with more things and not every detail needs to sound absolutely perfect. However, you shouldn't also expect that a very dense arrangement will simply hide your messy lines. So working on the detail is still very important. Talking about detail, uh, another thing that I really like to use is including a couple of live instruments. Now, that can be something quite random, like for instance small percussion, like this. That there is a wooden wrist shaker, absolutely drowning in reverb. Uh, let's look at some of the other things that I've done here. I've uh, recorded some uh, guitar, which is uh, tuned to a very bizarre tuning and is also quite out of tune and played very badly, but it fits with the rest. <laughs> You can hear that my very unorthodox uh, approach to playing the guitar here has given me something that almost sounds like an ethnic string instrument. Now, neither of these instruments are particularly dominant in the mix, but they do really add a little bit of life. Listen. And without them... give me just a little bit of extra motion and detail and a little bit of life. That's something that's quite important when working with virtual instruments as they have a tendency to sound a little bit static. Next let's talk a little bit about general signal flow and what I do to process my audio. All of my samples are hosted within Viana Ensemble Pro and then routed into Cubase as separate audio channels. That leaves me with a maximum amount of flexibility for further mixing and processing. As an example, let's look at the piccolo. On this channel, I'm using a single instance of FabFilter Pro Q2 equalizer. And if we open it up, you see that all I'm doing here is using a single high pass filter. This is something that I use on most of my instrument tracks, especially the higher instruments. And I'll show you the reason that I do this in a second. Now watch what happens down here in this range. You see that little bit of low frequency buildup just as the piccolo is playing its phrase? It's very low level and not really audible, but if you have a number of instruments playing simultaneously, then the cumulative effect of this buildup can actually make the low end of your mix quite cluttered. However, you have to be careful not to cut away stuff that's actually supposed to be there. Here I'm going with quite a modest 200 hertz, which leaves me with the sound of the piccolo perfectly intact. Applying a simple EQ is probably the extent of the processing I'll do to the individual instrument. Next, I group them into group tracks by library or by type. At this point, I'll add any additional processing in order to balance the libraries with each other. For example, these woodwinds here, we're using a panner, and let's open it up. Now, if we open up the panner, we can see that in order to get the woodwinds a little bit more focused to the center, I've just narrowed the stereo width a little bit. Let's look at the multiband compressor next. Here I'm using a preset that I've tweaked slightly called the low mid cleanup and it does exactly what it says on the tin. However, with orchestral music, I normally use very little compression and even if I do, I normally like to run it parallel. So in this case, we've got it mixed in at 32%. That means 32% wet and the rest is dry signal. The result is that the effect the compressor has on the overall sound is rather subtle. 
let's look at the mix bus next. Here there's hardly anything happening. The limiter is only there to act as overload protection and the equalizer basically only does one thing which is something I do quite often. I use a pair of high pass filters and set the equalizer to mid side mode. Cutting some of the lowest frequencies from the side signal has the effect of focusing the low frequencies in the middle. But for now let's move on and look at what kind of plugins are used for mastering. Here you can see three different what I would call character EQs, they're parallel EQs, and a multiband compressor, a regular EQ and a maximizer. In the mastering stage I'm not making very drastic changes to the sound so I'm using each one of these uh, plugins only to color the sound very slightly. As an example, let's open up the Hammer EQ by Kush Audio. You can see here that I've chosen to emphasize a few specific frequency ranges and it's very material dependent but in this case I've gone with 50 Hz for a bit more bottom, 500 Hz for a little bit more body and 15k for a bit of top end sparkle. All of these kinds of plugins are best used sparingly and that's also why I use a combination of them because each one of them brings out something different in the mix. And as for the rest, the multiband compressor is there to balance out different frequencies a little bit and it's also running in parallel mode by the way. Finally we've got the maximizer which is helping me hit the required loudness levels. Now something that we haven't really talked about is reverb which uh, as you can probably see here I've got three instances of Nimbus running for close, mid and far. But the details on how I use that and what I do with reverb is something that I'll cover in a future video. If you liked the music then the rest of the album is available on Bandcamp, Spotify and iTunes. I'll leave the links in the description. And if you have any specific comments or questions about this video then please leave them below and I'll try to get to them as soon as I can. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.